The Possession of Magdalene Grombach by John P. Besso. They destroyed her house as the white spirit had ordered, and in the dry well they found out why. For the best evidence of conscious personal survival, after death we must bypass the seance room, which all too often is the scene of conscious or subconscious impersonation, and study the accounts of spontaneous phenomena manifesting in the form of haunted houses and haunted people. One such account concerns Magdalene Grombach a young peasant girl who lived in the little village of Orlach in Württemberg, Germany. Magdalene was one of four children. Her father, industrious and honest, was a devout Lutheran and reared his family in his faith. One morning in February of 1831, Magdalene went out to perform her daily chore of milking the cows in the cowshed. She was amazed to find that the cows' tails were plaited together, as if the finest lace weaver had been at work. Thinking it some trick played by one of her schoolfellows, she disregarded it. But when the cows' tails were plaited in the same way on subsequent mornings, she and her family became perplexed and concerned, and finally determined to keep a nightly vigil on the cowshed. For several weeks they watched, and for several weeks the cow's tails were plaited by an invisible agency. One day, when Magdalene and her father were in the shed, and she was sitting on the milking stool, she was suddenly dealt a severe blow on her ear by an unseen hand. Her cap was thrown against her father some distance away. The Grombach family became convinced that some supernatural agency was at work. Often they saw strange birds and cats going in and out of the cowshed. Trifling yet puzzling things such as these occurred during an entire year and then they were followed by manifestations of a more serious nature. On February the 8th, 1832, when Magdalene and her brother were busily engaged in cleaning out the cowshed, they were amazed to see a bright flame burst up from the floor. With the help of neighbours, the flame finally was beaten out but no one knew how it had started. On the next day, strange fires of an identical nature broke out in their house. It was necessary to take all of their furniture out into the garden. Subsequently, for several days, mysterious fires ignited in various parts of the cottage, even though friends and neighbours kept constant watch inside and out. During this period, Magdalene first saw, while out in the cowshed with her father and brother one evening, about eight o'clock, a closely swathed, grey, shadowy woman who spoke to her in a faraway voice. Remove the house. Remove the house. If it be not removed before the 5th of March next year, great misfortune will befall you. The house has been set on fire by an evil spirit, but unless it be pulled down before the 5th of March next year, I cannot protect you from great misfortune. Promise that the house shall be destroyed. Magdalene promised. Her father and brother heard the voice, but could not distinguish what was said. Neither did they see the apparition. Magdalene saw and conversed with the spirit frequently after that, and apparently grew very fond of it. The apparition gave no reason for tearing down the house, but simply said that it was necessary. 
Further conversations revealed that the spirit belonged to a woman born in Orlock in 1412. She said that she had been forced to become a nun, much against her will, that she was bound, in a way she could not tell, to a black spirit, who now was intent on effecting harm on the family, and that it was her purpose to ward off this evil. She admitted that during her earth life she had been guilty of many crimes, which she refused to name, and expressed regret that she had committed them. Magdalene always referred to her as the White Spirit. On St John's Day, 1832, all save Magdalene attended church. She remained home to prepare the dinner. As she was thus engaged, she heard a loud explosion in the cowshed. She was about to investigate this noise when her glance fell on a heap of strange yellow frogs on the hearth. Wishing to show the frogs to her parents on their return from church, she was about to pick them up and place them in her apron when she heard a voice call to her, seemingly from the ground beneath. Magdalene, let the frogs go. At once the frogs all vanished. This event seemed to herald more awful phenomena. The poor girl was pursued by apparitions of frightful animals, by derisive voices and scornful laughter. One midday when she was in the meadow making hay, the apparition of a black man approached her and demanded, What does she want who comes to thee? Do not thou speak to her, but speak to me and I will give thee the key to the cellar beneath thy house. There are eight firkins of wine there, and many rich things. Saying this, he gave a contemptuous laugh and vanished. For several days thereafter, when she was in the hayfield, the black spirit appeared to her. She steadfastly refused to converse with him. He derided her father for carrying a Bible about him and told her that the mass was much finer and grander. He tried to induce his unwilling listener to have mass and said to keep the weather fine and threatened her with all manner of evil should she not cease conversing with the female spirit whom he called the bag of bones. He said that he was a monk and Magdalene always saw him dressed as such. Sometimes he mimicked the voices of her friends, seeking to have her answer. But she seemed to know his imitations and would not reply. Very often he foretold the future with accuracy, and one day he promised to give her, as proof of his friendship, a bag full of money. The very next evening, when Magdalene and her sister were at work in the cowshed, they saw a small bag near their feet. Upon opening it, they found it contained eleven golden and several thalers. The next evening, Magdalene encountered the white spirit, who told her not to keep the money, that it was from the black spirit, in fulfilment of one of his promises. The white spirit told her that for her obedience she would have other money given to her, and she requested Magdalene to buy a hymn book with it. The next day, Magdalene and her father drove to the hall and presented the bag of money to the orphanage there. On their way home, a shopkeeper hailed them and asked Magdalene if she were not the girl from whom he had heard so much. She modestly replied that she was, and he gave her a golden to buy a new hymn book with. The apparitions created by the Black Spirit were now so frightening that Magdalene often swooned or fell into a cataleptic state. Frequently she lay rigid for hours. Sometimes during these seizures she would strike out violently at anyone who approached her, always with her left arm and leg which were icy cold, while her right side was warm and quiescent. These attacks increased in frequency, and her frantic parents sought the aid of both doctors and clergymen, but they could not help her. Magdalene stated that, just prior to lapsing into these states, a black and frightful monster would appear and lay an icy hand upon the back of her neck. 
During an attack she would cry, The black spirit, it is he that plagues me. The doctors bled her with leeches, as was the custom at the time. But she would cry, This will do no good, I am not ill, no physician can help me. Asked who could help her, she would emerge suddenly from her trance and exclaim joyfully, I am helped, the white lady has helped me. At this time, the white spirit told Magdalene that the black spirit must for a while completely possess her physical body, but that she would lead Magdalene's soul to a place of safety during these intervals when the black spirit was in control. The attacks became more frequent and more violent. Magdalene said that even when she was doing housework, she could discern the outline of a monk's form, one in black. She never clearly saw his face. He would say, Wilt thou still give me no answer? Take care, I shall plague thee. Then she would feel his icy fingers grasp the back of her neck and his body press against her left side. Always this was her last conscious sensation. Then she would lie as in death. The pupils of her eyes turned inwards and her left arm and leg either moved up and down or extended, ready to strike. Her left side was always cold, while her right side was quiet and warm. These attacks would last four or five hours. During them, Magdalene's voice was hoarse and masculine, in every way similar to that of her tormentor. They always terminated in an extraordinary struggle between her right and left sides. When she had recovered, she said that she was not aware of having spoken in a man's voice, but that she thought she was during these intervals attending church, singing and praying with a congregation. These attacks occurred over a period of five months. On March the 4th, 1833, when workmen were tearing down the Grombach cottage, the white spirit appeared to Magdalene in dazzling white robes. She entranced Magdalene and spoke through her lips, saying that she had been seduced by the monk, who now tormented Magdalene and had aided him in his crimes. She told of centuries of anguish and penitence, and of her faith in an eventual release through the grace of Christ. With a wonderful and thankful prayer, the white spirit left the body of Magdalene. The spirit of the monk then took possession, and from Sunday night until Tuesday noon, Magdalene remained possessed. She ate nothing. On Tuesday, a large crowd gathered to witness the final demolition of the house and to question the monk's spirit. Through Magdalene he answered questions in a deep masculine voice, and he also expressed great joy that he would soon be delivered from his earthly penitence. He described the countryside, and it looked in the 15th century, and said that the ancient monastery of Crailsheim once stood on the site where the Grombach house and farm were now. An antiquarian present stated that the descriptions given fitted the known history of the district, and represented knowledge which Magdalene could not possess. Magdalene was taken to a neighbour's house some distance from her home, still entranced and with her face livid. She spoke excitedly as the demolition of the Grombach cottage progressed. Her voice was deep and masculine. The workmen had torn down the walls and were digging in the cellar when they came upon an ancient piece of masonry under which they discovered a large dry well filled with rubbish and human bones. Among these were the skeletons of several infants. Immediately upon discovery of this ancient well, Magdalene, though some distance away in the neighbour's home, awoke from her trance. Her skin resumed its normal colour, and she, confused on seeing so many strangers around her, hid her face and wept. Finally, she regained her composure and gradually became, once again, the normal healthy girl she had been nearly 18 months before. From that day on, Magdalene never heard, saw or experienced any further phenomena. 
had it all been in her mind, or were the spirits of a penitent nun and monk which had roamed the earth for four centuries in despair, finally released from the scenes of their infamy? In this girl, had they found a medium through whom they could tell their story?